Okay, 11 o'clock service. I have a challenge for you. Next Sunday, whoever sits right here wins. <laughs> wins what? I don't know. But we got this new in the round thing going on, and Rob and I are like, well, people still aren't sitting over here. And we're like going back to the drawing board every week. Maybe if we put the tall tables over there, people will like the tall table. Sit over there. You'll win. What? I don't know. Okay, I need to tell you, I got to repent. I got to repent here, and it has to happen now. It has to, has to happen in front of you, in front of God, in front of everybody, because this week, I lied. I know, I know. Believe it. Your pastor lied. And I lied in a big way, and I put it on social media, and I lied. So some of you may have heard of the sort of mini natural disaster we had in our main building this week. The giant aquarium, I've been calling it a fish tank. Here at the Woodlands UMC, we don't have fish tanks. We have an aquarium. This young pastor had to be schooled. But it spontaneously ruptured, okay, and flooded the hallway. It went down the elevator shaft. It was crazy. And I, w I did not see it, but I was able to be on the scene and report live from my Instagram account the, the occurrence and interview bystanders, and, and I may have lied and told some incorrect facts. So, we have a bit of my Instagram story here for you to see. Check it out, see if you can tell where I'm lying. Okay, Amy, please tell us what happened here. Well, by the grace of God, no one got hurt, but the aquarium just burst, and the water flooded out, and the fish flooded out. And... You saw it happen? Yes. You are an eyewitness account. <laughs> I was. My gosh. There are some people out there, when disaster strikes like this, they run for cover, and that's okay, that's, an, that's a response. But there are other people, when disaster strikes, who run to the disaster, and we have those people here. I am here with some innocent bystanders. <laughs> they are telling me that, what, what were you telling me? Okay. That the fish tank is like 20 years old, so they think it might have just cracked because it's really old. Okay, what Dana has told me, she's a very important person here at our church. What she has told me is that this fish tank was at least a thousand gallons of water. At least. Okay, everyone, I'm done reporting. The moral of the story here is that we have an amazing team. They are taking care of business. They are fixing this. This was uh, an interesting day at work in the office. Okay, so three incorrect facts. I was participating in the fake news, okay? Three things. The first is, can you guess? If you, a thousand gallons. Okay, it's not a thousand gallons. There's no way. We had someone say shortly after it's 400, and they were on facilities team. We're like, okay, 400. And so I tried to correct that. But now I'm hearing reports it's 750 gallons. I don't know. Maybe some of you are experts and you can shed light on this later. Someone on this campus knows, okay? So that's the first one. The second one, if you have little ones with you who love fish, maybe earmuffs right now, but not all of the fish survived. Some of them met their demise inside of a shop vac, okay? If they were really small, okay? And they remain there, probably happy, but not all of them made it, okay? And then the third one, can you guess? If you've been around here for a long time, you know that fish tank is not 20 years old. You know why? This building is not 20 years old, okay? So I disseminated incorrect information and I wanted to repent and go on the record. Strike those things from the record, please. I have now corrected it. So some of us just operate out of faulty information and we end up inadvertently lying or misstepping because we're ill-informed. And we can immediately correct, you know, as soon as we find out we're wrong, we can say, oh, that was wrong, and, and move on with our lives. But some of us do what my colleague, Brent Parker, he has coined this phrase. He calls it premeditated sinnery. <laughs> we, some of us know that something's wrong, and we just kind of 
make an excuse or just say, well, I have to do this because it will keep peace at work or what, you know, and then we just go ahead and do it. And so premeditated scenery. Now, the bad boy we're looking at today has a whole mess of premeditated scenery. In fact, his name is translated as liar. He is the deceiver. This is Jacob. I'm sorry if your name is Jacob. <laughs> There's redemption for you, okay? But Jacob in the Old Testament is a liar. He deceives his brother and his parents. His mom kind of helps him scheme and plot, but it's Jacob we're looking at today. And I got to tell you, every time I preach on Jacob, I just get so exhausted. His life is like a soap opera. There's all these drama-filled events going on, all this mess of his own making. It's kind of like watching that show Parenthood. Do I have any Parenthood fans in the Yes, good show. I watched the whole thing. It's available on Netflix. But it's exhausting. It's drama-filled. I'm not, don't go and label me someone who loves drama, okay? But this is Jacob's life. And so he's a bad boy. And I'm going to hit the highlights because we're, we're going to get to the good part where Jacob is redeemable. But um, I'm going to hit the high points of the backstory really quickly. So buckle in and try not to get exhausted. I know I will be. So he was born a twin. And in the womb, he and his brother Esau were like pitted against one another. They butted heads. And when they came out, they immediately began to butt heads. Their parents played favorites. Isaac loved Esau because he liked to hunt, and they were kind of outdoorsy together. Rebecca loved Jacob. We don't know why. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us. Probably because, I don't know. They're, it's his mom. So they're together. They're kind of on teams. And Jacob manages, when they're adults, to manipulate Esau into selling him his birthright for a bowl of stew. Now, I don't know what kind of stew this was, but you can guarantee it was not Cincinnati chili. Have y'all had that? It's like chili. It's chili on noodles. Bless you if you're from Cincinnati. We don't do it like that down here, but it probably wasn't that because that's not worth a birthright, okay? Next, Jacob and Rebecca scheme and plot against Esau and Isaac. And when Esau is old and blind and he's on his deathbed, he says, Esau, go and hunt and bring me food. And Jacob actually puts on a disguise, pretends he's Esau, and goes to Isaac. And Isaac gives Jacob Esau's blessing. It's like the last will and testament. Everything that was supposed to go to Esau now has gone to Jacob. And you better believe when Esau found out about this, he wanted revenge. He hated his brother. So Isaac and Rebekah were like, Jacob, just get out of town, go live with my kin over here, and maybe never come back because Esau's anger burns like fire. So Jacob leaves. He goes and lives with Laban. Laban kind of gives him a taste of his own medicine, a little swindling there. Um, but Jacob eventually settles down. He gets a wife or two or four. It was the Old Testament. We don't do that now, right? But he settles down. He's got a clan of his own. He's got all this cattle and stuff. And the Lord visits him in a dream. And the Lord says, you know, I want you to go back home. It's that famous dream with Jacob the ladder. The angels are all going up and down. And the Lord says, I want you to go back home because that's your home and that's your land and I'm gonna give it to you and I'm gonna fulfill my promises through your lineage. And in this dream, this is when God is like binding himself to this man who is named the liar, right? God's name is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God is redeeming Jacob in this. But so Jacob is shaken in his boots or sandals you know, Old Testament. And he's like, how am I supposed to go home? Esau wants me dead. And so he trusts God. He gathers his whole clan and everybody. And they begin to make their way home. And Jacob sends a messenger to Esau. And the messenger sends, you know, 
hey, hey, brother, how you doing? I want to make good. Here's a peace offering of like 200 cattle and some goats and all this. Um, Love you. See you soon. And Esau responds, and he says, I'm coming to meet you with 400 men. This was not the response Jacob wanted. But he presses on. They're already en route, and he trusts God. So the night before they're going to meet Esau, Jacob, they're on the, the banks of the Jabbok River, and he sends his whole caravan and his family across to the other side of the river, and he stays on the one side. And that night, God comes and visits him, and they wrestle all night long. And this is no regular wrestling match. You can imagine when you wrestle with God, you may die, but Jacob did not. And God blessed him, gave him the blessing of Abraham, and said, I will fulfill my promise and my lineage through you. He gave him a limp, and he gave him a new name. You will no longer be called Jacob. You will be called Israel, and that will be the name of my chosen people. And so this all happens right before our scripture passage where we are going to look today. This happens the night before they meet Esau. And so let's look at this scripture passage together. It'll be on the screens. Genesis 32, verses 1 through 11. Jacob has crossed the river now, and it's day. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids, and he put the maids with their children out in front, then Leah with her children, then Rachel and Joseph, last of all. He went himself ahead of them, and get this, bowing down to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, who are these with you? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near their children, and they and their children and bowed down. Leah, likewise, and her children drew near and bowed down. And finally, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. And Esau said, what do you mean by all of this company that I met? And Jacob said, to find favor with you, my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please. If I find favor with you, then accept my present from my herd hand. For truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God since you have received me with such favor. Please accept my gift that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me. And because I have everything I want. So he urged him and he took it. So this is a huge moment in their lives. Years and years of built up resentment and frustration are melted away in this reunification of these siblings. They share an embrace of forgiveness. And so Jacob has lived this bad boy lifestyle for so long But we can learn still from this story. We have some things to take away from here. The first is that any time there's to be true reconciliation, there's probably going to be some type of wrestling beforehand. And so when you have done a wrong to someone, it's best to go before God, take yourself before God, and wrestle a bit with what happened and what's going on so that you can find out what your part in it was and be able to take responsibility for your part in it. But I caution you, don't do this alone. You do it best in the presence of God because we let God do the convicting and the correcting. There was a time in my life where I should not have been trusted to analyze my own behaviors, right? Like, I would have either been on this end where I made a whole ton of excuses for my behavior and, you know, well, I had to do it because of this and and I would have been too lenient. But more often than not, I was on this end where I was a piece of trash 
and I was irredeemable, and everything I did was terrible, and I was harsh and rigid and hateful to myself. But when I came into relationship with God, and he began to convict and correct me, he brought me in the middle. And he said, yeah, there's some things we need to look at, but there is nothing you can do that makes you irredeemable. There's nothing that you can do to separate me from you. I love you, and you're my child. So when you do the wrestling that happens before reconciliation, do it in the presence of God, and maybe in the presence of someone like a mentor or someone who's been there before you. So there's always wrestling before true reconciliation. The next point that we can take away from this story is that true reconciliation requires humility. You remember Jacob went out in front of his whole caravan to meet his brother and 400 men. And he made himself vulnerable. He prostrated himself down seven times in front of his enemy. He exhibited humility. It's as if each bow said, I'm, I was wrong. Please forgive me. It wasn't like a begging or a pleading, but it was just an admission of wronged, wrongs having been done. And so humility and vulnerability are necessary for reconciliation. But when I think about bad boys and wild women, I don't really think about humility. I mean, look at, look at these people up here. Do they look humble? No. They look proud. They look like they got it all together. And you know what? Pride in our society, it's kind of sexy. It's kind of like, ooh, they're the lone wolf. They're the bad boy. Like, it's not... A, it's not our culture's way to like venerate and worship a humble person. And so humility is what's necessary for true reconciliation. When I'm living the lifestyle that pride brings, it's really, really difficult to say, I was wrong. Pride actually doesn't utter those words. Pride keeps us trapped and isolated from others. Pride keeps us from asking for help or receiving help. Pride keeps us from receiving love and healing and grace. Pride is easily embarrassed because pride has a reputation and an image to maintain. Pride is a close cousin to shame. And shame, that's another sermon another day, but shame has all sorts of destruction that it causes. And pride can become so comfortable that it's, a, it's like a lifestyle. It's a covering that we put on each day, and we don't even know we do it. We just move through life this way. But humility, humility offers us so much more. The humility that Christ exemplified on the cross that's the humility that gets us out of messes of our own making. It gets us out of the trouble that life brings. This humility has the earth-shattering power to bring people back together. This humility has the power to bring us back into right relationship with God and with one another. So humility is kind of an easier road to live. When I'm walking the path of humility, I don't have to worry about my reputation. I don't have to worry about what you're thinking about me. Doesn't mean I'm perfect at that, but I get to walk forward, receiving God's grace, knowing that I'm gonna take some missteps every now and again, but I always have the opportunity to come back and say, hey, I, I think I may have done something wrong there. What, can you tell me, I want to take responsibility for that, and I want to make this right. Christ offers us an endless opportunity for forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. Christ, that's what he went 
to the cross for was to remove our sins from us and remove the consequences of sin from us. And so he gives us a way to live into humility. Jacob was somewhat forced into humility, right? He wrestled with God and he came away with a new limp. I think that limp was there. There's all sorts of scholarly discussion about what the limp was about. But I think for our purposes this morning, the limp is a good representation of, I'm never for- going to forget this. And I'm, I'm never going to forget this humility, this walk that I can live out forever. Now today, I've been teaching on seeking forgiveness. So from the perspective of Jacob. And I've taught in loft on forgiveness before, and, but it's more been how to forgive, because boy, that's a, that's a hard row to toe, right? Like, Sometimes I'm more mad at a person for aggressing against me because I know I'm going to have to do the hard work of forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard. But um, I also think about Esau in this story. So the fruit of humility was there with Jacob. We see the softening of his heart. We see him move toward his brother in humility. But we don't really see what happens with Esau, but there's definitely some good fruit there. I don't know when he decided he was going to forgive his brother and come back in relationship, but it happened. And it reminds me of a story um, that happened during World War II. Um, Some of you may be familiar with Corrie Ten Boom, who was a Dutch woman who her family, when she was younger, her family hid Jewish people in her bedroom closet from the Nazi and the Gestapo. And eventually, her family was caught doing this. And so they were imprisoned in a camp called Ravensbrück. And after the war, she was released. But unfortunately, her sister died in that camp. She watched her sister die a slow, painful death there. And she was released and was somewhat rehabilitated and began to travel preaching on God's forgiveness. She was a Christian. And she traveled around this war-torn country, Germany. It was 1947. And she said, in those days, you preached a message of forgiveness and just blank faces stared back at you. They were shell-shocked. That country was, was torn up and the people were traumatized. And so if they received that message, she sure didn't know it or see it. They usually just gathered their things quietly and left the room. But one day, there was a man who did not quietly leave the room. He came toward her. And immediately, she recognized him. She said from one moment to the next, she saw his gray overcoat and his brown hat. And the next moment, she had a flash, and he was wearing a blue uniform with a visored hat with skull and crossbones on it. He was a prison guard from her camp. He did not recognize her specifically, but she knew exactly who he was. She recounts this flashback. It came back with a huge rush. This room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center, the shame of walking past this man naked. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me ribs sharp beneath her parchment skin. And now he was in front of me, hand thrust out, saying, a fine message, Fraulein, how good it is to know, as you say, that God forgives our sins and that they are cast to the bottom of the sea. And she says, I, who had just spoken so glibly about forgiveness, did not take his hand fumbled in my pocketbook, pretending to be busy. He continued to talk, and he shared with her how after the war he had become a Christian, and he had come to learn of God's forgiveness of him. But he, she mentioned being in Ravensbrook, and he was a prison guard there in Ravensbrook, and he said to her, but I want to hear it from you. Fraulein, do you forgive me? He put his hand out again. She froze. She knew 
from experience with working with others that forgiveness was not a feeling. You see, shortly after the war, she opened a home, a rehabilitation home for those who had been in camps. And she saw firsthand that people who were able to forgive their captors and abusers, they were able to leave the facility and go and build full lives again. But those who nursed their resentments remained in the home and remained invalids. It had a physical effect on them. And so she stood there with coldness clutching her heart. She doesn't know how many seconds passed, but she said a silent prayer. Okay, Jesus, you've got to help me. I know that, that forgiveness is not a feeling. It's an act of the will. So I can put my hand out, but you've got to help bring the feeling. You've got to help bring my heart into this place. And so she stuck her hand out and grabbed his. And in that moment, something miraculous happened. She said she felt the charge start in her shoulder, and it jolted down her arm and into their joined hands, and immediately a sensation of warmth covered her whole body. And she said, brother, I forgive you. I forgive you with my whole heart. I forgive you. And this moment, she said, was the hardest moment of her life, but she never knew God's love so intensely as she did that day in that moment. And so when I think about Jacob and Esau, years of sibling rivalry, years of resentment and pain, wrongs done, but they were able to come together and forgive and reconcile. It could only have been something that God had done. Some of us came in here today standing in need of forgiveness. Some of us are exhausted by living our wild woman or bad boy life. Some of us are so tired of managing everything that people see or hiding or keeping different parts of our life separate so they don't talk to each other and know what we're doing. Some of us are tired and we need some forgiveness and we need the coat, the cloak of humility that Christ offers to us. But some of us are in Esau's shoes and we came in here with resentments and we came in here needing to forgive. And let's be honest, there's a healthy way to do all this, to forgive and ask for forgiveness. It's not a one-and-done thing. It's a process. There's lots of scholarly material about it. But some of us stand in need of giving forgiveness. And so if you're in one of these camps, I wonder if you'd be willing to pray with me. If this is your prayer, would you pray with me now? Let's go to the Lord. Oh, Lord, some of us came in here in so much pain. So much pain from hurts and wrongs. So much pain from broken relationships. Sins that have been done against us. And sins that we have committed. Lord, I pray that you would minister to us now in our inmost places. Would you touch those wounds of pain? And would you begin to work a good work in each of us here? God, would you pour out your spirit over us that we might be ushered into a new season, a new way of life, that we might tap into the humility of Christ on a cross and that we might tap into that love that passes all understanding, Lord. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.